In December of uh, 2010, Tarek Boazizi lit himself on fire in the marketplace where he sold fruit to protest against uh, corrupt acts, unjust acts by tax collectors in Tunisia. This set off a wave of protest across the Middle East, resulting in what we call the Arab Spring, which was really about citizens protesting against corruption in undemocratic regimes. Two weeks ago in Iraq, Citizens stormed the Green Zone in the Parliament building to protest against government corruption and a lack of service delivery. And on Thursday, in Brazil, President Dilma Rousseff was essentially suspended from office awaiting impeachment trials, having to deal with corruption scandals in the government involving money laundering and government kickbacks. Corruption is a problem across the public sector in the developing world. Typically, when we talk about corruption, what we mean is the abuse of office for private gain. What does that mean? Well, it can be any kind of small, petty corruption, like uh, paying a bribe. It can involve being absent from work when you're supposed to be at work. It can involve a failure to provide services or actually stealing from state coffers. Corruption has been noted to be a problem all around the world. And today, what I'm gonna do is talk to you about certain efforts. First, I'm gonna talk about why corruption persists, and then I'm gonna talk about efforts that organizations and individuals and citizens are doing to actually fight corruptions. I'm gonna tell you three stories. The first about polling stations in Afghanistan. The second about smartphone applications and social media in South Africa. And the third about health clinics in Cameroon. Now, what I want to focus your attention on in terms of thinking about corruption is that corruption is very hard to observe. Why? Because people committing corrupt acts don't want to be caught, right? So they tend to keep any illicit activity hidden so nobody can, can see it. So I'm going to focus on how we can think about ways to actually observe corruption. And from that, I'm going to think about ways in which we can use our ability to observe corruption to actually fight corruption. And in that, I'm gonna talk about the role that technology can play in doing this. And this is very uh, simple technology. It's, it's technology that most of us already have on our smartphones and our laptops. Why does corruption persist if it's so bad? Some people like corruption, actually. Uh, what if I told you that if you paid a bribe to uh, a DMV worker that that would get you to the front of the line? That sounds kind of appealing, right? Or if you gave a gift to a teacher to get your uh, uh, child moved to the head of the classroom in an overcrowded crowded classroom. So a lot of people actually engage in corruption because it kind of works for them. The problem is, is that if we individually cheat the system, it makes it worse, worse off for everyone else. And you know, a lot of times corruption involves things that are a little bit more uh, important than just the line of the DMV. And so we have a consistent body of evidence in the social sciences now that corruption negatively affects economic growth, it negatively affects democracy and governance and rule of law, and it frequently leads to the lack of provision of services. So corruption is one of the main reasons that developing countries stay poor. How can we stop corruption? Well, to talk about stopping corruption, I'm gonna first have to make two confessions. The first is that I really love burritos. And the second is that I am sometimes blinded by this love. Let me explain. I grew up on the East Coast, but then I uh, went to graduate school in Southern California. And as the result of living in San Diego for eight years, I really came to learn to love burritos because San Diego has amazing burritos. And because I'm very close-minded and parochial, every time I would travel anywhere else in America and try to get a burrito, it just didn't taste as good as they did in Southern California. So when I moved to Seattle a couple years ago, I basically said, look, I'm going to move to Seattle. It's great. I'm probably never going to have a good burrito there. Um, but that's OK, because Seattle has great sushi and great seafood. So I'll focus on that. So last summer, I got kind of tired of sushi eventually. And uh, I just really, really, really wanted a burrito. And you know, I'd never had a burrito in San Diego, so I didn't even know where to look. And as a result, I went on to Yelp, and I thought, OK, I know Seattle has to have a Chipotle, at the very least, right? So if I go on to Yelp, I will find the location of Chipotle. And I was hoping it was in, within walking distance. So when I Yelped burrito in Seattle, 
I found that one of the highest rated places in the whole city was a block and a half from my house. And I'd never been there. I, I didn't even know it existed. So somewhat reluctantly, I thought, OK, well, at least it's a block and a half away. It gets high ratings. It's probably better than Chipotle. Uh, I guess I'll go there. So I went there, and it was amazing. It turns out that there is really good Mexican food and really good burritos outside of Southern California. Uh, I learned something. So now I go there all of the time. I'm not going to tell you the name uh, because this is not a paid advertisement, and I also don't want any longer lines when I go there because it's, <laughs> it's already very popular. But if you Yelp it, you will probably find it. Well, what does Yelping burritos have to do with corruption? I want you to think about what Yelp did for me in this instance. The first thing it did is it simply provided me information about the location of restaurants. And Yelp is a really good service for doing that. It just gives us information. But Yelp also gave me the ratings of restaurants to help me pick a place that was higher quality. One of the problems of corruption in the developing world is that sometimes people simply lack information. Maybe they lack information because they have ideological blinders, like my love of burritos in San Diego and my unwillingness to admit that they're good anywhere else. Or maybe they lack information because information is just hard to get or it's costly. So if you're the manager at a DMV, it might actually be very hard to observe and monitor everyone who works for you. And how do I know if, you're, if, if, uh, if, if all of you are trying to bribe uh, Aunt Patty and Selma to get to the front of the line, how, do I, how can I observe that as a manager? It's very hard. Also, it's very hard for citizens to always monitor what their governments are doing because governments have incentives to hide when they don't perform well or anything re reflects negatively on them. So Yelp does two things. It gives me information just sort of about things, and it also gives me a rating about how well this one particular restaurant is doing. But here's the brilliant thing about Yelp. Restaurants know that you're Yelping them. You all, as customers, are, in a sense, potential auditors of every restaurant that you go to, providing ratings if you go to the website. And owners of restaurants understand that, so that the more that you all are crowdsourcing your ratings through Yelp, the more that restaurants should actually be improving their services, because they know that people are going to make the decision that I made, which was to go to this place over Chipotle. And so what that does is not just the rating system itself, but knowing that you're being rated, it can ignite behavior change and actually improve things that are very important, like the state of burritos in Seattle and in San Diego. <laughs> Could we then think of a way to Yelp governments, that is, to provide information to people in a feedback mechanism, but also to provide some sort of rating that would ignite behavior change? Well, first, I'm going to talk to you about designing such a Yelp system to fight electoral corruption. And I'm going to tell you a story about Afghanistan in 2009. Now, how many of you even knew that Afghanistan has elections? You should know, because uh, if you're an American, a lot of your taxpayer dollars go to support it. Uh, yeah, Afghanistan has had elections, actually, consistently since the overthrow of the Taliban. They've had presidential and parliamentary elections since 2004. And millions of Afghans vote. So for those of you who think, oh, democracy is so foreign to Afghanistan, uh, it doesn't appear foreign to the voters of Afghanistan. Um, and they vote despite sort of significant threats and issues in doing so. Now, why are elections important at all? Well, elections are a cornerstone of democratic government. And they give citizens the ability to hire the politicians that they really like, if they've done well, and fire the ones that they don't like. So ironically, an election is like an extended episode of The Apprentice. <laughs> and this time around, we may actually be hiring or firing Donald Trump, the host of The Apprentice. The problem is that elections in emerging democracies frequently suffer a lot of electoral fraud and a lot of electoral corruption because they, they haven't built the institutions that are strong enough to support fair elections. So even though people like elections, they're constantly being undermined. So what the international community has done and what international donors has done is to sort of use uh, resources to support technical and diplomatic assistance to improve elections in new countries. And what that typically means is having uh, missions of international observers go to polling stations on election day and kind of see the process, what's going on, look around them, and then kind of form some judgments about that and hopefully uh, publicize a result that says the election was free and fair. 
And I have been one of those monitors myself. Uh, when I was in graduate school in 2009, an organization named Democracy International invited me to come observe the election that they were helping to observe in Afghanistan. Yeah, my parents were thrilled, by the way. <laughs> Democracy International has worked to support elections all over the world, but this was a really important election. Uh, President Hamid Karzai was running for, for re-election amid growing violence from the Taliban, and the Taliban was actually threatening voters and, and polling station workers. They said that they would kill voters and that they would cut off their fingers if they saw that they voted. It was an important election, too, because Karzai and the Afghan government had to start proving that they could sort of stand on their own and manage their own elections and be capable of doing that because, you know, the United States and, and NATO were not going to stay in Afghanistan forever. So this was a real test, of, a real test uh, for the Afghan government. As an international observer, I found that we were really constrained with resources and our numbers. Um, first of all, I observed in Kabul, the capital city, I'm in a polling station when I'm taking this picture, and this is actually my personal security detail who looks very angry. We couldn't stay at polling stations for longer than 15 minutes, given the security situation. So this is not necessarily like the most conducive activity if you want to sort of form judgments about an election. Secondly, there were way too few of us to really impact the process in a lot of ways. Uh, there were thousands of stations that weren't monitored at all, and we were very limited in where we were able to go. So it's very hard to form a judgment about an election in this kind of scenario. Having said that, I did witness corruption firsthand. Let me tell you the story. So voting begins at 7 a.m. on Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, and uh, 7 a.m. on election day in Afghanistan, and I was at a polling station at 6.30. And I looked over at a ballot box, and I noticed it was full of ballots. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because people shouldn't have voted yet. There should be 30 more minutes. So I went over to the polling station manager and I said, so uh, your polling station isn't open yet and it's not supposed to be open yet. Why are there ballots already in the box? And he said, oh no, there's no ballots in that box. And I said, <laughs> no, the ballots in that box right there. And he looked at me and he looked at the box and he said, like I said, there's no ballots in that box. So I had observed kind of firsthand what we call ballot stuffing or, or likely fraudulent votes stuffed in favor of a candidate in this instance. And this just made me kind of feel like feckless and helpless and what was really the point of us being there if we couldn't stop this kind of thing from happening. And I only kind of got lucky seeing it in the first place. Um, and that really caused me to kind of question the wisdom of international observation if there are ways that we could actually improve it. And unfortunately, in this election, the international community didn't do a whole lot to actually stop corruption. There were thousands and thousands of ballots that were uh, investigated and declared fraudulent, and that really undermined the legitimacy of Karzai and the government. And it certainly was an election that didn't live up to the promise of the millions of Afghans who turned out to vote. So this caused me to start thinking about innovations to reduce election fraud. And I was really focused on kind of three core areas. The first, how do we see it? The second, how do we stop it? And third, could we expand our coverage? Could we go to more places than international observers were able to go? So basically, I went home after Afghanistan, I went back to the United States, and I would soon get the idea, I would soon get the chance to actually answer these questions because the, Afghanistan was gonna have an election the next year for parliament in September of 2010. So I went back to San Diego, and uh, I met up with my colleague and, and, and friend, Mike Callan, who was also in graduate school at the time, and he had also been in Afghanistan and was interested in elections. And over a series of months, we had meetings, mostly held in bars, um, where I don't know whether it was the, the, the beer or the arrogance of youth, but Mike and I just had these crazy ideas about what we could do to try to stop election fraud. Like we'd have thousands of international observers with thousands of domestic observers and, and they'd stay there all day and they'd write down everything they could and we, we'd have them move around and, and all this stuff. And we realized this was totally implausible. It was gonna cost millions of dollars. And so we didn't know what to do. So the logical step was, well, just get on a plane to Afghanistan and you'll figure it out. So, Again, working with Democracy International, we moved to Afghanistan that summer, and that's Mike there in the corner, and we started to actually think through, okay, let's get serious. How would we actually do something? What could we actually do? First, we wanted to ask ourselves, well, who is most likely to cheat, and how will they cheat? 
we needed a theory of the case. That is to say, a theory about how it is and who it involves and where it happens and how you see it to really understand, okay, how are you going to stop it? Here's our theory of the case. Most countries, including Afghanistan, have their elections managed by what's called an election commission. These commissioners, uh, it's sort of a body that's very hard to witness, know what's going on inside. With, with thousands of candidates running in the parliamentary election, so there were thousands of candidates running for hundreds of seats, we thought, if we were powerful people in Afghanistan running for office, we might try to influence some of these election commissioners. I don't know, maybe we'd intimidate them, maybe we would bribe them, maybe we'd be related to them and they would sort of act on our behalf, but this would allow us to I don't know, artificially inflate the vote beyond kind of the real ballots that we got. How would they do it? At every polling station in Afghanistan, and this is true of a lot of countries, the polling station manager who oversees the process, at the very end of all, counting all the ballots, has to produce what's called a declaration of results form, or a tally, and this is an example from Afghanistan. And what the tally does is, it sums up all of the candidates and all the totals that they got, and the polling station manager then has to post a copy of this tally on the outside of the polling station for everyone in the community to view. Carbon copies of this tally are then sent to different parts of the election commission, and ultimately the head office in Kabul, in this instance, then gets these tallies and then certifies the vote result. Now, I'm thinking if I'm a corrupt politician and I have a lot of power, a lot of money, and I had access to someone who had access to these tallies, they could potentially change the tallies on my behalf. I don't know, let's say I got 100 votes and they added a zero, so now I have 1,000 votes. Or let's say they don't like certain candidates and they just crossed out their names. That would be a really, really easy and efficient way to change what the vote result otherwise would have been. So Mike and I thought, okay, this is probably how they're gonna cheat. But how are we going to observe this at all? This is this obscure institution and we have no access to it. So we developed a technology that we called Photo Quick Count, and it's incredibly simple. What we do is we hire Afghan uh, election observers, we train them, and we ask them to take a photograph of the tally at the polling station after it's been posted. We then compare that photograph to the, fo to the tally that the election commission ultimately certified, and in a, clean, in, in a fair election, those should look exactly the same, right? They're all, they're all supposed to be carbon copies. But if people are changing them for whatever reason, there could actually be differences. So that's how we're going to observe the corruption in this instance. And you would be surprised at the differences that actually occur in tally. So this, this is from a photograph that our observer took. This is from what the commission ultimately certified. These are supposed to be from the same polling station, okay? Most of you probably can't read Dari, but um, up here, the names of the people uh, in terms of who was the polling station manager have changed. The person here is using Dari's script in terms of candidate totals. The person here uh, crossed out candidates and used uh, Arabic numerals up here. They don't match at all. It's like these are from to two totally different polling stations, but they're supposed to be exactly the same. So then we thought, okay, this is how we observe it. What is, the, what is the thing that we could develop that would actually stop it? What's this like new drug that we could invent that would inoculate election officials against uh, cheating in this way? Well, think about what works with Yelp. The fact that people know you're Yelping them. So Mike and I thought, well, what if we just told them that we're doing this? Like literally just said, hey, we're doing photo quick count. So here's how we did that. We had our election observers deliver, deliver a letter to polling stations on election day while people were vo voting that literally did just that. The letter basically says, congratulations, your polling station has been randomly selected to have its uh, vote count audited with photo quick count. We will come tomorrow to take a photograph of the tally. We will compare it with the tally at the election commission. And any differences between the two, we will see as evidence of, of potential corruption. And we will publicize the result. All we did was tell them that we were doing this. Now, it follows a very, very simple insight in psychology and behavioral economics that the minute you tell somebody you're watching them, they change their behavior, right? So this letter should have no effect if people are already following the law. It shouldn't matter. 
But for people who might have otherwise been cheating, you can imagine that maybe it would cause them not to do that now if they thought they could get caught. Mike and I were evaluating this new technology, and so we needed to do what's called a randomized impact evaluation or a scientific evaluation to make sure that it actually works. So similar to a drug trial, we couldn't just give the drug to everyone. We had to give the drug to some people and then have a control or a placebo group that did not receive the drug to see whether or not the drug actually worked. So what we did is we took a sample, a nationwide sample of 471 polling stations in 19 provinces. This is, this is now going to show you what it looks like just in Kabul. And we took a, a, a sample of polling stations and then we randomly assigned to certain polling stations to receive this letter, this announcement of monitoring, and other stations not to. But in both stations they would have their, uh, the photographs taken. And then we would basically compare the results of those two groups. So what is the effect of the letter on the likelihood of electoral corruption. All right, so did it work? In the tallies in our sample, 78% of the polling stations had differences between uh, the photos that we observed and then the photos at the commission. So 78% of the time, there are differences. A lot of times it's additions to certain candidates, other times it's subtractions, some of the times it's both. The letter announcement reduced the likelihood that the tally was torn down or otherwise stolen by about 60% and reduced the likelihood of fraudulent votes for the most politically powerful candidates by about 25%. So that's a pretty big effect of having this letter delivered. Okay, you had the letter delivered, but was it cost effective? Well, the largest international mission in Afghanistan in 2010 spent, we think, upwards of about $10 million and they visited 85 polling stations. Mike and I were in graduate school at the time. We could barely afford rent. Uh, I guess we could afford beer, but uh, we, we couldn't really afford rent. So we couldn't, you know, we couldn't have this big expensive thing. We actually did get some research funding and we spent a little bit less than $100,000. And we went to 471 polling stations and we actually demonstrate evidence of impact, whereas the international observers did not. So we think it's extremely cost effective. When we replicated this study in Uganda, we found that international observers spent $6,200 per polling station, and we spent about $40 per polling station. Well, based on this cost effectiveness and trying to grow the program, I really was interested in thinking about how to scale this, because all we're doing is like telling people that we're monitoring them, and then we're taking a picture. Isn't that, someone that, any, isn't that something that any voter could do if they're already at a polling station when they're voting? So to think about scaling, I worked with colleagues um, for South Africa's 2014 election. So now I'm gonna tell you a story about a smartphone app and social media. Basically what we did here is we tried to expand the program to make it citizen-based and citizen-adopted so that citizens can become their own election observers rather than have uh, international or other researchers do it. And so we did that by developing a tech platform, think of like an app, basically, called VIP Voice. VIP stands for voting is power. And basically, the app allowed us to communicate with people on dumb phones via SMS, uh, people who are maybe don't have smartphones yet, but it also did allow for web-enabled smartphones and for us to be able to use uh, social media channels as well. And basically, what it allowed us to do was reach millions of potential users, hundred, uh, hundreds of, a uh, couple hundred thousand of whom engaged with the system, and then tens of thousands of whom were sort of giving us updates of the election as it was happening and their experience during the campaign and their experience on voting day. And then actually we had citizen volunteers, citizen election observers, agree to sort of yelp their polling station in a way and take a, a picture of the tally. But I don't want you to leave today thinking that I'm just like always interested in criticizing developing countries for being so corrupt. I want us to also think about you know, developing Yelp systems to sort of improve people's performance is maybe a, a nicer way to say stop corruption or stop any, any sort of wastage. And along those lines, I'm now working with my colleague Jake Robin at the World Bank on health services in Cameroon. Now the Cameroonian Health Ministry is really trying to improve their own systems. But, and they built health facilities all over the country. The problem is, is that doctors and nurses aren't always there, medicines aren't always stocked, and there's a general lack of provision. And so they're interested in actually trying to improve that. Well, how they're doing that and the work that we're working on now is something called community performance-based financing, where the government both incentivizes performance for doctors to be there at work and, and make sure they're prescribing medicine and things like that, 
but it also introduces an internal auditing and performance system that is essentially like building its own internal Yelp system that allows it to also monitor the performance of these doctors in these health facilities. So they're not just paying them more, they're also monitoring them more. So they sort of built their own internal Yelp system. Jake and I had this idea to sort of innovate beyond that, and we said, well, what if we also had an external Yelp system? That is to say, in addition to the government monitoring its own employees, what if we had communities also monitor these health facilities? And so with community performance-based financing, what we do is we work with non-governmental organizations to hold community meetings with community members in the areas of the facilities to sort of discuss what are the health priorities in their areas and provide both positive reinforcements to the health facilities but also uh, information and ratings about areas to potentially improve. So this is sort of like an external Yelp system. And who better to Yelp the provision of health services in Cameroon than the people of Cameroon? Applications like I'm describing have now grown all over the world. Uh, this is an example of I paid a bribe from India. It's very easy to set up these websites and it's sort of easy to advertise and try to get people to engage with them. But I want to end by saying I don't think it's, e I don't think it's what's easy about these systems that's important. Rather, I think it's about what constrains us sometimes that shapes how we innovate. Mike and I were constrained in thinking about election corruption because we knew it was nearly impossible to observe and even harder to, to stop. So we had to develop a theory of the case. Every institution and organization and agency may work differently. A theory that works in one place may not work in another, and a method of detection that works in one place may not work in another. So we can't just sort of apply the same, the same program anywhere and hope that it's gonna work in the same way. Everyone who wants to do this needs to develop the theory of the case of the institution that they're working on to figure out exactly how it is that you would catch corruption and hopefully stop it. The second lesson is another way that we were constrained, which is simply by resources and budgets. Nobody has as much money as they actually want you know, to do anything. But don't let the simple be the enemy of the complicated. All we did was tell people we were monitoring them. All we did was deliver a simple letter. It wasn't really that complicated. And we started out with all these complicated ideas that were gonna be really, really expensive and hard to do. But sometimes it's just a very simple, narrow thing that sort of relates to what we know about human psychology that actually drives behavior change. It's not the technology itself. It's just an understanding of how human beings think and behave. And that being said, I think the technology is really important for thinking about citizen scaling because that gives us more users. And citizens are usually the people who are exposed to or witness corrupt acts. And along those lines, I think it's also the case that it may in fact be citizens that start having to hold their governments more accountable and not just bureaucratic managers. Elections are incredibly important to everyone. People, you know, people like in Afghanistan or Uganda or South Africa. Everyone who lives in a democracy deserves to have free and fair elections and to have a processes that reflect the wills of the voters, particularly when they fought so hard for it. But I would be remiss today if I didn't end by, uh, by acknowledging that our own country has had a fraught history of elections. And very, very recently, The United States does not consistently design ballots or have machines that are able to read them very, very well. So in Florida in 2000, um, you, you guys know what happened. So we're, we're not very good at necessarily running our own elections. There have been recent attempts by legislatures and courts to actually suppress the right of citizens to vote, including the Supreme Court overturning part of the Voting Rights Act. And it now appears that violence and demonstrations and protests are almost a permanent feature of political, cam uh, political campaign rallies, both inside and outside. So I just wonder if there aren't things that American citizens could do to improve their own elections by sending a text or a tweet describing their voting experience to hopefully improve democracy in our country as well. Thank you.